Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our five minute histories videos. And I'm here in Northeast Baltimore at the Mount Pleasant Golf Course. And we're gonna talk about the building behind me, Taylor's Chapel. But before we do that, I'd like to start with a birthday dedication. And let me read to you from an email that I received uh, not too long ago. It's from a woman named Elise. And Elise writes, my boyfriend Peter introduced me to your five minute histories. Thank you, Peter. Because we live some distance from each other, he and Frederick and I in Arlington. We spend the week apart, then spend the weekends together. We've taken to saving each week's five-minute histories to watch together on the weekends. Thank you both. Um, she goes on, Elise goes on, I'm wondering if I could dedicate an upcoming five-minute histories to Peter for his birthday. Well, first of all, if the thought of these two folks uh, making a long distance relationship work in this dark time of COVID uh, doesn't warm your heart, I don't know what will. And second of all, of course you can dedicate a five minute histories video uh, to, to Peter. Um, so Peter, happy birthday from Elise uh, and happy birthday from my colleague Molly and me and all of us at Baltimore Heritage. We hope you have a really good one. All right, well, let's talk about, let's jump in and talk about Taylor's Chapel behind me. It was built in 1853, but we're going to turn the clock back and start a ways before that, back in the 1600s. And that's when three brothers named Taylor uh, come to Maryland from England, um, John, Joseph, and Thomas. Um, John gets a tract of land called Taylor's Choice. Um, we know that today as Joppa. That becomes Joppa. Joseph gets a tract of land called Taylor's Hall. And that today is where Texas, Maryland is. I've always, I must admit, I'm always a little bit confused about Texas, Maryland. But if you know where that is in Baltimore County, that's, uh, that was Joseph's. And Thomas gets a tract of land called the Ridge. And Thomas is kind of a mover and a shaker. He's in the Maryland General Assembly, in the lower house and then the upper house. Um, he is a justice on our provincial court. Uh, he is a deputy governor and he's a counselor to Lord Baltimore. And in fact, at his estate, the Ridge, is where William Penn and Lord Baltimore met in the 1680s to first try to hammer out the boundary between Maryland and Pennsylvania. Um, they, they couldn't do it at the, at the Ridge in the 1680s. It took almost another hundred years, uh, 1767, I believe, when George Mason and Jeremiah Dixon and their surveying skills finally got the boundary set. But, uh, but back in the ridge in the 1680s, uh, at least those two gentlemen made a good attempt at it. Um, all right, well, Thomas was a Quaker. He was a good Quaker, uh, and he had this estate, the ridge. He also had a son, Richard, um, and Richard was a good Quaker as well. Richard started purchasing land in Baltimore County. This was bought part of Baltimore. Baltimore County at the time. He purchases an estate uh, that has a terrible name. It was called Ill Will for whatever reason, but he purchases that um, around here. He also uh, incidentally purchases a tract that has a much better name, especially for a Quaker, called Friendship. And Friendship is down at 25th um, and Hartford Road, so uh, much nearer to Baltimore Town than where we are now. And he gives that over to the Quaker Church for a cemetery. And in fact, there still is a cemetery uh, there today, even though we whiz by it in our cars and, and hardly notice it. Um, uh, so Richard does that. Richard has a son named Joseph, and this is where we our story of our chapel kind of begins. Um, Joseph uh, purchases this property here um, uh, some time ago, and he's another good Quaker. He, in fact, is one of the founders of the Gunpowder uh, Friends meeting, the monthly meeting, um, and he's their first clerk. But he also apparently had a wicked bad temper, and he was kicked out of the Gunpowder Friends meeting for speaking what they called evil uh, of some of the other Quakers. Um, and not only that, it may be worse, he refuses to apologize. And so for speaking evil and not apologizing, he is kicked out of the meeting. Um, and when he leaves, not just his immediate family leave, but, uh, but his whole extended Taylor family leaves, um, and they start meeting for worship. They still consider themselves Quaker in each other's houses. But Joseph buys the par parcel of property next to his, and this is the parcel that we're on now. And he, uh, he erects a log building, that's what it's called in his journals, um, for his extended family to start meeting there and holding Quaker meetings. Even if, if nobody else recognizes them as Quaker, they do. 
And so um, they go along for a while. When he dies, he leaves the parcel to uh, a nephew, Joseph, and it sort of passes down from nephew to nephew um, until a gentleman named Joseph the IV uh, is the owner. And Joseph the IV uh, is, uh, is maybe not so good a Quaker. And in fact, by the, eight, the early 1800s, um, he is uh, switched over to Methodism. Interestingly, in the 1770s, uh, at the famous minister Asbury, the Methodist minister, the, uh, known sort of as the founder of American Methodism, comes through here. He gives a famous uh, uh, speech at uh, Lovely Lane Methodist Church downtown. That's sort of the creation of American Methodism there. But he also stops at this log structure, um, which has been a uh, host to Quaker meetings, and he preaches here. And maybe that's what got Joseph IV uh, motivated to switch over. When he dies, uh, he leaves the log building um, and property to the Methodist Church. And that's how we switch firmly into the Methodist camp here at Taylor's Chapel. Um, and, uh, and Methodists uh, use the building for a while. And in 1853, though, they decide they need a proper chapel. They tear down the log building and they build the chapel that's behind me today. Things go along pretty well until about 1900. And that's when, for some reason, and I don't know why, but the congregation had dwindled so that, uh, so that meeting here was not feasible. There were too few people. And, uh, and at that point, um, things sort of peter out. The building is more or less abandoned. In 1925, the city buys the Taylor estate, um, and, uh, but they apparently don't want an old Methodist uh, chapel, so they buy everything except for the chapel in the graveyard. Um, and things get a little bit worse. Uh, both are vandalized. But by 1950, uh, we have a second uh, birth, if you will, We've got a group of volunteers come together, um, including uh, one gentleman from the Peel Museum uh, downtown, come together as volunteers. And they get out their, their paint brushes and their hammers and their mops and their brooms. And uh, hour by hour, these volunteers uh, spruce up the chapel, uh, get the graveyard in good order, um, and uh, give the building a second life. Um, and 10 years after that, in the early 1960s, St. John's Methodist Church uh, takes it on. It's rededicated as part of St. John's Methodist Church. Um, and they meet here at least a couple times a year uh, to keep the building going. And that's the way it is uh, today. So for 60 years, uh, we've had this wonderful building um, that is maintained by volunteers. Um, and in fact, before uh, the COVID crisis, uh, a number of years before, um, we had an in-person tour here uh, led by some of those volunteers, um, including a woman who coordinated it, Barbara Panowitz. Um, thank you so much again, Barbara. Um, and what's really wonderful is uh, these volunteers are not only keeping the building looking great, uh, some of them are it's more or less inherited their volunteer stewardship from their mothers, and I believe some from their grandmothers. So we're now on our third generation of volunteers uh, keeping this wonderful historic gem uh, looking so good. All right, I'm going to leave it there and say thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.